While the Space Coast nowadays is well known for its ever-growing launch cadence, work continues at the spaceport that never sleeps as a myriad of projects continue development. Work continues at the orbital launch mount. We've got a lot more hardware for Blue Origin's New Glenn rocket, and maybe even an expansion of Port Canaveral in preparation for even more aerospace-related activity. Howdy, everybody. My name is Max Edmonds with NSF, and we'll be taking a look at all of that and more on this month's Space Coast Flyover. That water is a beautiful color today. Holy cow. Oh, wow. As always, I won't be alone today as Alex and Adrian are both on hand to help sort through everything that's happening here at the Cape. So without further ado, We'll go ahead and start it off with Alex to see what's happening at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. You may remember from our last couple of flyovers that we had seen SpaceX reworking the Starship Tower sections that remain here at the Kennedy Space Center and that we'll eventually go to Starbase for the second launch tower there. Well, part of that work we've seen was to introduce internal stairs, something that we've also seen at Starbase, but there's been some other additions in the meantime. From this latest flyover, we can see crews have installed the hydraulic accumulators for the tower on the tower section that will eventually be housing the ship's quick disconnect arm. Meanwhile, on the other section, beams have returned for the levels that had been dismantled to perform the stairs work. It's definitely interesting to see SpaceX has decided to complete this work here before moving these sections to Starbase and do all that work there, but it's not like I really have any experience building Starship launch towers, so... Yeah. But anyways, continuing with the Starship launch tower hardware, we have work continuing on the chopsticks and their carriage system. We can see that hydraulic accumulators have also been installed on the carriage system and our flyover team spotted crews right on the moment they were installing one of the ends of the carriage system. These ends will connect to the tower's rail system and provide the firm support needed to carry the loads from the chopsticks to the tower's structure when stacking vehicles or catching them. While only one was being connected at the time of the flight, the other three are staged nearby for installation, something that we hadn't seen on the previous flight. It's nice to see that SpaceX is completing this work now rather than, you know, having to put all of these things later down the line and trying to rush everything. Another bit of progress that we've seen here at Roberts Road is the construction of the north expansion of the Hangar X2 building. We now have the columns and beams for the entirety of this area and work is starting to take place to put the exterior walls and panels. Moving over to the west of Hangar X2, we can see that the SpaceX has installed a new drainage system here at Roberts Road with three waste pipes now leading to the retention pond on the west side of the complex. Additionally, what appears to be a new communications tower has been built on the northwest end which is another sign that SpaceX is here to stay. We've also seen more progress on the little building being built on the side of the Hangar X2 building, although one thing we didn't see on this flight this time around was a booster outside of the Hangar X2 facility. We did see a fairing half, but by the looks of it, I'm sure this one is not flying anymore. Okay, but now for something that may actually fly soon, I'll throw it off to Adrian and what's going on with Blue Origin's new Glenn. Oh look, we got open doors for Harry. Let's move our attention to Exploration Park, where Blue Origin is continuing its work on facilities related to New Glenn and beyond. Let's start at the south side of Blue's campus, where we see more progress on the composite assembly building. Berms have been erected to the side of the building. The giant extension still features a pile driller and it seems that the foundation work is still ongoing. However, around it we can also see a hive of cars and activity present. You can see the places where the foundation and rebel was placed already, as the small pins are out of the ground. And it looks like some shells for concrete pouring are also being prepared, as the orange frames are around it. It seems we will see a lot of progress here soon. In the area next to the main area of the composite assembly building, we now see some ground preparations as well, as Blue is clearing up more land there. Compared to last month, this now has the sand distributed all over the area instead of the giant piles. Speaking of a lot of progress, the parking lot close to the main warehouse building is making huge progress. Where they did not fill out the whole footprint in the past month, it is now showing a full sand foundation where the new parking area will be. This area will also feature a new office building, which will be on the north of the parking space. Let's check in with the 2CAT, the second stage cleaning and testing facility, which, surprise, features a second stage. 
a second stage tank is inside of the facility undergoing testing. Given the advanced state of Blue in the new Glenn program, this is likely some flight hardware undergoing early preparations. It of course still misses paint or some other key features, such as engines most likely, but a pressure test is always a good sign. Is that not enough hardware for you? Well, we have more. A tank section of a new Glenn is laying around close to the TCAT. Of course, this is not a full first stage, as if you compare it to previously seen first stages, it is way shorter. So it is probably missing the interstage and potentially also other tank sections. But it seems to be well wrapped hardware, getting ready for some assembly and testing. The TCAT itself sadly is not kind to us on this flyover. The doors are closed and we do not get to peek inside its doors to potentially spot a New Glenn first stage in there as well. Well, you win some, you lose some. And if you want more hardware, look at these rings. These rings are the stuff that New Glenn is made of. They look to be on some sort of transport and work section, which probably helps to install hardware to them. The giant transporter rig, which is used to transport full New Glenn first stages, is also no longer present next to the construction site, where it was left the last time we flew. Let's move over to Blue Origins Launch Complex 36, where New Glenn will fly from. Over at the pad, we see the second stage transporter erector is no longer vertical at the pad. Instead, it was rolled back to the hangar and is sitting in front of it. This structure would be used to test second stages at the pad and would function as a kind of adapter to place the second stage on top of it. Next to it is the second stage we have seen in the past for fit checks. This is most likely not flight hardware and was used in the past to test out the pad. Which of course means the pad is completely empty right now. You can see the giant launch mount right now not hosting any TE or test stage. But with Blue apparently still targeting a launch before the end of this year, this might change soon. Speaking of potential testing, the FCC received a license application by Blue Origin lately that confirms testing to be performed at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. While the April date has passed on this, it is still good to keep an eye out for more of these licenses. It also note that these applications are to receive readiness for the first launch of New Glenn, which is one of four certification flights for NSSL. Also, Jarvis is gone. The Jarvis test tank that was in the process of being scrapped the last time we flew is now fully gone. You can no longer see it next to the tents at the pad. Maybe a sign of Blue getting rid of old hardware and of producing more. That's it from Blue this week. Let's check in elsewhere at the Cape. Relativity continues with their groundwork at Launch Complex 16 in preparation to finally host the company's newest launch vehicle, Terranar. The company recently shared some of their own drone shots of the pad, showcasing the progress being made over at LC-16, between the mounds of dirt and soil being moved around and compacted, as well as additional land clearing. Workers are already installing the water lines at the pad and preparing the ground for the new horizontal integration facility that will be used to support Terranar. As a reminder, Terranar is Relativity's entry into the medium lift launch vehicle market, aiming to compete with the likes of SpaceX's Falcon 9 and ULA's Vulcan Centaur. Heading back over to the Kennedy Space Center, right across the street from Blue Origins campus, we can see progress on the expansion to Airbus OneWeb's satellite manufacturing facility. Foundation work is still ongoing here as teams prepare to build up this facility in the near future, which will eventually hold a footprint of 49,000 square feet, or about 4,500 square meters. Another area of progress worth noting during this flyover was related to the new Mobile Launcher 2 platform over in the crawler yard at KSC. ML2 is designed around and will be used to launch the SLS Block 1B rocket once it's fully developed. The base of the Mobile Launcher continues to grow and soon teams will be installing it on six mounts located in the crawler yard where it will reside until its construction is complete and it's time to relocate for testing. Considering ML2's size and weight, that installation will require a lot of work. First. Four self-propelled module transporters, or SPMTs, maybe you've heard of them from Starbase Live, will lift the base 18 inches, or about half a meter. Next, eight jacks will lift the base 18 feet, or 5.5 meters, off of the SPMTs. Once that's complete, the massive Crawler Transporter 2 vehicle will lift the base another 2 feet, or 61 centimeters, higher to pick up the structure and carry it about 61 meters out to the mounts. Once located on these mounts, 
teams will start stacking the new launch tower on top of it and installing a wide variety of plumbing, wires, and other connections that will fuel and power the next variant of SLS. Another place where we're expecting to see a lot more build-up soon is at the SpaceX's Starship launch pad within Launch Complex 39A, although for now, instead of build-up, it's more of a build-down? Let me explain. During the last flyover, we talked about how SpaceX had removed the legs of the overall launch mount for that pad. Well, with the legs removed, SpaceX has been hard at work to start digging down on the ground. Well, for now, it's hard to see what else is being done here other than dig down on the ground. It kind of has to be some sort of precursor for foundation work for the new orbital launch mount. We've yet to see if that new launch mount will change the designs or just be an upgraded version of the existing design, but you can bet we'll keep flying and seeing the changes as they happen. Now, one interesting change that I've noticed in the last few flyovers has been the removal of some of the scaffolding on the lower sections of the Starship Tower. Not a huge amount of progress, sure, but progress after all. This tower should eventually be outfitted with all of the systems required to run the chopsticks and fuel and power the ship through a quick disconnect arm, so that means we're bound to see more noticeable work here sometime soon. In case you don't remember our last flyover video, I presented four potential options for what might happen with this Starship launch pad based on what we had seen, some more optimistic and some more pessimistic. The most pessimistic option that I presented will have been to think that SpaceX was tearing down the legs of the overall launch mount because they had completely given up on flying from 39A and were tearing down everything and moving it all elsewhere. Well, just a few days after we published that video, Elon did a presentation to SpaceX employees at Starbase outlining the near and long-term future of the Starship program. Right there during that presentation, he confirmed that SpaceX is aiming to activate this Starship launch pad by the middle of next year with another launch pad going up at the Cape as well. We've covered this as well in earlier episodes. SpaceX is looking at building a launch pad for Starship on the Cape Canaveral Space Forces Station side of the Cape, with a primary candidate being Space Launch Complex 37B and an alternative to this which will be a yet to be built Space Launch Complex 50. With two launch pads at the Space Coast and two launch pads at Starbase, SpaceX will certainly have plenty of launch infrastructure to ramp up Starship's launch cadence in the near future. But for the moment, only Falcons fly from LC-39A, and one interesting upgrade that has been recently made is the addition of liquid oxygen tanks to the existing tank farm. These were transported a few months ago via barge and have been awaiting installation ever since. On this latest flyover, we were able to spot them now at their new location and even potentially plugged into the tank farm systems to be used at some point soon. These tanks will increase the liquid oxygen capacity of the tank farm, allowing SpaceX to be able to do faster recycles with Falcon Heavy if that were to be needed. Moving over to the other SpaceX launch pad in Florida, we can see a Falcon 9 rocket vertical as Space Launch Complex 40. This is of course nothing rare these days, with launches happening from this launch pad every 4 to 6 days on average. I have a spreadsheet for that. This Falcon 9 in particular was the one for the Starlink Group 6-55 mission that lifted off the night of when this flyover took place. In the time since, another Falcon 9 has rolled out at the launch pad and may very well have launched by the time you're watching. That's the amount of cadence that they have there. An interesting thing we saw on this flyover was the new look of SpaceX's payload processing facility just about a mile away south from this launch pad. It has not only been partially painted with the SpaceX's black and white colors, but also in this shot we can see what appears to be workers lifting and installing a new Starlink Community Gateway antenna. This can be seen on pretty much every big SpaceX facility with either one or multiple of them installed and are supposedly capable of delivering up to 10 gigabits of download and upload speed. As it's one gigabit of upload and download, I only get like 300 megabits, so like, yeah, I don't know about that. They already have the legs up on that booster. They had them up when I uh, was coming in for my shift. Over at Port Canaveral, SpaceX's fleet was mostly out at sea and we were only able to spot Bob and just read the instructions. This is very common these days where we barely spot anything out there in terms of you know the SpaceX fleet and whatnot. Although the very next day, both Bob and just read the instructions left to support another Starlink mission, of course. It's very rare to see the full fleet at port these days, but even then, port traffic is becoming quite an issue with the fast turnarounds that SpaceX wants to perform. Not only does it have to coordinate those turnarounds with different recovery teams, but they also have to coordinate with all of the other boats and vessels that go in and out of Port Canaveral. 
especially the Disney boats. Plus, in the near future, we're going to see another company, Blue Origin, fight for space for their own recovery vessel and reusable boosters. And it is because of this that Space Florida is proposing expanding the amount of available dock space for launch companies. This proposal presents various solutions to the ever-growing launch cadence from the Space Coast and the advent of more and more reusable rockets. The study assumes up to five different launch companies may be constantly launching and landing rockets up to 50 years from now averaging well over 1,000 launches and landings each year. There were at least three major changes discussed in the study, which estimates that accommodating Port Canaveral for that future may cost up to $2 billion. One of these changes involves expanding to the north, the west turning basin at Port Canaveral. In order to do this, a new channel will have to be cut and the 401 road will be rerouted around the new dock space to the north. A second proposal looks at expanding the middle turning basin also to the north. This will involve cutting a new channel up north and, once more, rerouting the 401 road around it. This one will be a bit more problematic because it will involve tearing down and relocating existing Space Force buildings such as the Sands Space History Center. A third option looks at the possibility to build a dedicated wharf near Launch Complex 34, but this will have problems with environmental regulations given the state of the conservation of the Cape's seashore. Based on what this study says, the winning option from these will be the one that expands the middle turning basin to the north. In the first phase of that expansion, the turning basin will just be expanded up to the current location of the 401 road without any disruption to it. Later, this road will be rerouted on the next phase, literally paving the way for the new wharf to be built up from the south up to the north. Well, that just about does it for this month's Space Coast Flyover. Which company are you watching closest right now? When will Starship finally make it here? Will New Glenn be successful on its first flight? And when will Terra and Arv make its first flight? Feel free to let us know in the comments section down below. I'm Max Evans with NSF, and thanks for tuning in. Peace out, Girl Scouts.